Sport has the power to build strength and confidence. Heal, inspire, and bring communities together. This is Level Playing Field. Hello and welcome to Level Playing Field. I'm your host, Greg Westling. Today, we meet the man behind Parasport TV, a streaming service dedicated to showing Canadians the games we play. But first, we hit the ice. As far as Parasports go, blind hockey is relatively new to the scene. But for the captain of the Canadian national team, Kelly Serbu, it's the same game he fell in love with as a child. Now, while he works to bring the sport of blind hockey to the world stage, he reaches out to a community of children to remind them to dream big. Many of these children getting ready to hit the ice at Ottawa's TD Place Arena dream of one day scoring the big goal in the big game. As Kelly Serbu gets a goal to make it 3 nothing, Captain Canada finds the back of the net. These days, scoring big goals is something Kelly Serbu does on a regular basis as the captain of Canada's national blind hockey team. But four decades earlier, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, young Kelly's love affair with hockey was fueled by that very same dream. Kelly uh, was very interested in hockey right at the beginning. He really loved the sport. My father was in the military, he was a clearance diver. So I grew up on base in Shannon Park. When he was probably about three, I was out at sea for a while and I came home and uh, I took him skating. There was a base arena and a lot of times it was left vacant so we, the two of us could just go out on the ice. So we're passing around, playing with each other, skating. I think he could skate very well early. It was a chance encounter with a coach that sowed the seed of Kelly's passion. According to his father, Nick Serbu. I had him at the rink for a skate and we were uh, leaving the rink and in the foyer there was a fellow that I knew that uh, was registering boys for hockey and uh, the guy said, uh, Kelly, uh, what team are you on? And he put his head down and says, my dad won't registrate me. And because he was only four years old, you had to be five. And the fellow said, no, he can skate well enough, register him and let him play. So we did and that's when he started. Today, it's a chance encounter of another kind. A chance for these kids from the blind and partially sighted community to get inspired by Kelly. Oh, and you're the perfect age to be on the ice. To don the skates, gloves, and stick and play the sport loved by Canadians across the country. So left-handed means shooting-wise, so I'm right-handed too, but I shoot left. It's yep. the first ever Tri Blind Hockey Day organized by Canadian Blind Hockey. They've partnered with the Ottawa 67's Major Junior Hockey Club and the Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group for the event. The 67's mascot is here for some fun, and some of the 67's players jump on the ice to help officials from Canadian Blind Hockey, including Kelly, demonstrate hockey skills to the kids and help them participate in some drills. So Jack, what grade are you in? Uh, I'm still in kindergarten. You're in kindergarten? Yeah. It's exchanges on the ice with kids, like young Jack, that show Kelly's eagerness okay. to not only spark love of hockey, but also his abundance of positivity. Well, I hope to, you know, pass on to, you know, younger kids and adults or people that are my age sort of what, what I found successful that's helped me succeed in my career and, and in life and just sort of my, my overall message of being positive. Fans out here this evening, the Centennial Cup, the 1991 edition of the Centennial Cup with your Sudbury Cup. The Kelly has a lot of practice remaining positive. At 17 years old, while he was playing Junior A hockey for the Halifax Junior Canadians, he noticed his eyesight was beginning to deteriorate. After several months of tests, Kelly found out why. When I was given the diagnosis, it was, Kelly, you have Stargardt's, and the only addition I was told was, by the time you're 40, you'll likely be legally blind. That was it, full stop. And I left, drove my mom uh, back to work, and then I went to hockey practice. The news of Stargardt disease resonated through his family. His father, Nick's first reaction was denial. I thought then that, uh, I was, there's got to be a cure, uh, something could be done, you know, it's not a permanent thing. I mean, he's still fine. It was a pretty, uh, pretty difficult time, but like uh, his sister and his mom and I, you know, we all pulled together. Parents 
instill in their children, you know, values that, you know, they carry with them for life, right? So with my parents, what they instilled in me was a work ethic, but also the confidence that I could do anything and be anything that I wanted to be. So for me, it's one sec. For me, when I lost my vision or started to lose it, it was hard, right? But at the same time, I had all the support. The tools his parents gave him served Kelly well during this challenging time in his life. So while the dream of playing hockey at a higher level was dwindling, there was always a plan B. Hockey was very important in my life, but also education my parents instilled in me very young. So I knew I was going to university. It was higher learning that led to a new dream for Kelly to pursue. He was already attending St. Mary's University in Halifax, but buckled down after getting his diagnosis. In the meantime, he refused to watch hockey from the sidelines and continued to play. Tom Hickey was a teammate during those days and remains a close friend of Kelly's today. Kelly was the type of player that you always wanted on your team. Good skater, kind of had some grit, and um, seemed like a real good guy in the dressing room. Despite his vision deteriorating to the point where he surrendered his license and started riding the bus, Kelly was still able to play hockey because of his knowledge of the game. It meant no more rides for teammates, but it didn't mean the end of hockey for Kelly. I played, you know, competitive hockey my entire hockey career. So you learn the game, you know where you're supposed to be. So at times on the ice, if I couldn't really see where the puck was, I had enough other sort of skills that I learned over the years to, you know, watch where people are looking on the ice. I was back out there, Starbo with the puck. And then just work hard. And, and really, if you watched my game in junior, really was not noticeable at all. Yemenin with a low shot. The rebound there to Starbo and Barrett. He played two years of Junior A with the team, but as Kelly's vision on the ice was fading, his focus on his education sharpened. To help with this transition, he and his family reached out to the CNIB. So I went to meet with the people there and they had like a vocational specialist for people going to university. And I started, you know, trying to find out what help could I get so I could get through my courses to read easier because there was a lot of reading. And when I got eye tested uh, shortly after seeing the people at the CNIB, I was told I was legally blind. When he did lose his vision, it was challenging him and uh, probably uh, hardened his resolve to, to push on for harder and to prove that he could do things. There was no medication, there's nothing that anyone could do for it. You know, so my, the way I was raised by my parents was that you work hard for things and you get out of life what you put into it. Apart from not driving, to me, life was just gonna continue and I was gonna do everything I wanted to do. Just getting caught offside there, number 22, Serbu going to the bench. He had a tough shift out there. He made about four solid hits and it almost... You're watching Level Playing Field with Greg Westlake. Welcome back to Level Playing Field. Sport Explained, Blind Hockey. Blind hockey is a variation of ice hockey for athletes who are legally blind. Like all standard hockey rinks, the ice surface is 60 meters long by 30 meters wide and is surrounded by a wall called boards. There is a center red line that divides the rink in half and two blue lines that create 30 meter defensive zones for each team. There are nine face-off dots, the main being at center ice. The nets are set in each defensive zone on opposite sides of the ice surface four meters from the end boards. The nets in blind hockey are three feet high, as opposed to the standard size of four feet tall for traditional nets. Blind hockey uses a 14 by 4.8 centimeter steel disc that is just over three times the size of the rubber puck used in other forms of hockey. It has eight ball bearings inside that rattle and make noise, allowing players to hear and follow the puck around the ice. Six players from each team are allowed on the ice at any one time, typically divided into three forwards, two defensemen, and a goaltender. The forward positions consist of a center and two wingers, a left wing and a right wing. Players use traditional ice hockey sticks to shoot, 
pass and carry the puck across the ice. A typical hockey stick is composed of a long slender shaft of 160 centimeters with a flat blade of 30 centimeters at the bottom. Sticks are customized based on size of player and their preferences. Players must pass the puck once in the offensive zone before shooting to allow the defense and goalie to hear and locate the puck. Once the pass is successful, a high-pitched chirp alerts everyone and the attacking team can shoot. If players stopped at any time, even in attacking zone, players must complete a pass again before shooting. When the puck beats the goalie and crosses the goal line, the attacking team is awarded a goal. The team with the most goals at the end wins. Now you're ready to take a shot. Welcome back. I'm Greg Westlake. At 19 years old, Kelly Serbu was declared legally blind and thought his competitive hockey career was coming to an end. Little did he know, it was only a pause. It's at this busy Ottawa gym that Kelly stays on top of his athletic game. Today, he's adding weight and cardio into a bustling work day. He strives to find a balance between his role as captain of the Canadian blind hockey team and a very successful career in law. Juggling a heavy workload with hockey is a skill Kelly learned after his first year in university. I ended up on academic probation. I was, you know, maybe uh, partying a little bit too much, playing a little bit too much hockey, not focusing on my studies. So the second year when I found out that I had, you know, an issue seeing, uh, that's when I started to buckle down when I came to school as well. Kelly felt self-employment was the way to carve his own path. So after undergrad, he decided to go to law school. His father, Nick Serbu, says nothing was going to stand in his way, not even the logistics of study itself. He was getting uh, some of the books that were, that were readers, but uh, they would read so slow that it would take you like three times to get through the book than if you could read them, read them yourself. So uh, there was a lot of time consuming things for him. Kelly became a criminal defense attorney and spent the first 10 years of his career in the courtroom. He felt right at home. It's an adversarial system, so you're in there and you know, you're representing your client and you want to make sure that justice is done. So you have to be prepared and on your game and stick up for the, the little guy things he's always done on the ice. Close friend and former teammate, Tom Hickey, is proud of what Kelly's accomplished in law. I think the best game Kelly's played has been played in the courtroom. Um, and he defended people for the last 20 years um, as a professional lawyer. That amazes me more than what he does on the ice. These days, he works with former Supreme Court of Canada Justice, Michelle Basterash, on sensitive legal issues. I was very fortunate to, to obtain the services of, of Kelly because of his experience and uh, as I got to know him because of his intelligence and common sense in dealing with these issues. I admire him tremendously. Through it all, Kelly has never stopped playing the game. Even when he believed his competitive years were behind him, he joined any game of pickup hockey on offer including a weekly Thursday evening shinny game at a local Ottawa rink. Then back in 2015, he caught wind of a group of folks attempting to build a national blind hockey team. He was intrigued and met with the top brass from Canadian blind hockey. I came and they explained to me the rules and who was playing and sort of the caliber and their vision that someday they wanted to create a national blind hockey team, but they weren't sure when that would actually happen because they were still trying to recruit players and building the sport, you know, grassroots trying to get, you know, a lot of youth programs going. Soon after, Kelly got his first taste of blind hockey. What blew me away was the, the compete level. People never gave up. Like diving in front of pucks, working to get the puck, working to take the puck from you, um, it's just off the charts, right? And that's still the way when I play blind hockey that, you know, if you're out there and you're being lazy and slacking, someone's going to come by and knock you down a peg because there's no quit. Eventually, the national team was born and now practice on a regular basis. Executive Director of Blind Hockey Canada, Matt Morrow, fully recognizes landing a player with Kelly's pedigree was a coup for the program. 
Kelly is one of the most uh, decorated blind hockey players in terms of able body competition. He's played in some very high level tournaments compared to many of our players who, who either lost their vision too early in their careers um, and didn't progress to the same level or players that never had the opportunity to play because there was no blind hockey when they were growing up. One of the players from Team Canada that was able to progress to a high level in his junior career is centerman Jason Yuha. Despite all that experience, he still looked to Kelly for guidance when he joined the national program. He uh, showed me the ropes of the blind hockey game, both coming from uh, like playing a good hockey, so he kind of knew where it's coming from, so he kind of gave me some pointers of what would work better for me on the ice and what he found works good for him. Like, so that was nice, yeah. Head coach of Team Canada, Paul Karens, witnessed the mentorship firsthand and was able to watch the relationship grow into a friendly rivalry. To see the two of them uh, battle in practice and see how they push each other is great. That's a dream for me. That's all I want is them to push each other because they're helping make each other better every single time they step on the ice. And as a coach, that's, that's all I can ask for. The focus right now is to grow the game, which is why it is important to showcase it to as many people as possible. At the recent Eastern Regional Blind Hockey Tournament in Ottawa, Team Canada took to the ice to face their main rival, Team USA, in a three-game series. Competing in the second ever International Blind Hockey Ice Series. Ever since day one, the goal was always to create international competition. So our plan was to bring the sport to the United States, which we have. Now the goal is to bring the sport to Finland, to Sweden, to Russia. Uh, our hope is to have a four nation World Cup of blind hockey in 2021. And ultimately our goal is to apply for inclusion in the Winter Paralympic Games. If you have that carrot out there for people, especially kids, something to aspire to, it's a lot funner to play the game. Right? Knowing that you know you could at some point in time represent your country. Team Canada. As Kelly Sermu gets a goal to make it 3 nothing, Captain Canada finds the back of the net. And as Kelly advocates to bring blind hockey into international competition and to the world stage, he has this message for kids. If you can't see, believe. As Clank has it wrestled away by Kelly Serbu, the captain for Team Canada, fires one right on, and it's a hat trick for Serbu with three minutes remaining in the second period. Canada go up 10 to two. Kelly recently added more to his busy schedule when he was named president of Canadian Blind Hockey. This once again shows his dedication to the game on and off the ice. After the break, we go live with Parasport TV. Stay tuned. More to come on Level Playing Field. Welcome back to Level Playing Field with Greg Westlake. Let's not sugarcoat it. Parasports suffer from a lack of coverage from the media. While this is clearly a problem, one Toronto man is doing his part to fill the void with his online streaming service, Parasport TV. Far side, there's a shot right on and it's in the back of the net as Chaz Fisher opens up the scoring. Long before the Parasport TV stream goes live at an event like the Ontario Winter Games Para Ice Hockey Tournament, Nico Cardarelli is on site making sure everything will run smoothly when the players hit the ice. After all, he's not just the voice of the platform, he's also the cameraman and the technical support. Being a one-man show is a challenge. It's hilarious to see me. Imagine me doing play-by-play, -play, operating the camera, jumping around between the, the laptop and the tripod to update the graphics. It's, it's a bit of a gong show, frankly. Um, so yeah, operating it by myself is definitely a challenge. Puck is dropped and we're underway here in the second. General Manager of the Canadian National Blind Hockey Team, Luca DeMontis, was impressed seeing Nico managing a broadcast. The first time I saw him do that, I told him, you don't have enough arms, right? And he's, uh, he's dedicated. And that's what it comes down to, right? He's dedicated. And the one thing I think I've noticed is he takes pride. This is his product. This is his platform, right? So he knows he's going to get it done. Shot right on. Good block that time. Lee. Luca's glad Nico created Parasport TV and says his passion during the broadcast means so much to the players and to their families. The one thing I really love is the energy. Man trailing, makes the pass. Stick handles, what a save! As the shot right on came from Kevin Sorm. And that means a lot for us because 
This is a product that we use and a product our players love. So when it's Kelly Serbu or if it's Jason Yeeha Yuha scoring a goal that's putting his team in the lead, he's got nicknames for a lot of the players. Scott Yuha with them takes the tape pass. Oh, what a goal! Wow. Yeeha Yuha! But it was the Minister of Defense who set that one up, Tristan Lindbergh. Which is kind of cool because guys never had nicknames, you know what I mean? And now to be able to go back and to share the footage with family, with friends, it gives them that feel that, hey, I belong, and gives them that little pro touch. Mark DeMontis wheels out of his own zone, 35 seconds left in the period. For blind hockey player Mark DeMontis, the broadcasts serve more than just a means for raising awareness. I'm a very technical uh, athlete and I'm always looking at you know my own mechanics as a player and what I can do to, to better myself, uh, better my own game. We've turned the live stream of the Blind Hockey Tournament to definitely game tape for us to, uh, to better ourselves. And uh, I know we've even done on the national team, we've even checked out the footage to, to see what we can be doing in, in certain tournaments and certain events, checking out certain players we're up against. It's, it's great quality. Uh, wouldn't want to put it to waste, take advantage of it. So Greg, a chance here for Team Central to create some offense on the power play. Well, and it's been such a close game. They just need a break, you know. They, they just need one thing to go their way, and then I think the ice will shift, uh, you know, in their direction. I wanted to see firsthand, so I joined him for a game of pair ice hockey at the Ontario Winter Games in Aurelia. That was Team Central's best chance of the game so far. That was far. a great pass. Under the sled, drop pass, just laid it there. I love area passes for shooting, when you can just skate into it. it makes such a difference. I'm not a videographer by trade, I'm not a streamer by trade, but it's stuff that it's all at my fingertips. I can accommodate all of that, so why not? And again, if it helps to spread the word about the Parasport community, then I don't see any downside to that. Nico's not the only one that saw that there was a gap in the media landscape. Executive Director of Canada Blind Hockey, Matt Morrow, saw an opportunity as well. I think there's definitely been a void in para-sport coverage. Uh, you know, traditionally other sports that uh, I've been involved with, such as goalball, have not had a lot of coverage. And now that Nico has had such experience with blind hockey and he, he's built the business para-sport TV, he's now in turn broadcasting other para-sports as well. Great save, he gets his own rebound and he scores! While there is a ton of praise for Nico, he is the first to highlight where the real focus should be. In a way, Parasport TV, as much as I get the experience of doing more play-by-play -play and getting more reps, it's a way for me to, um, I guess, share the bigger story here. Because it's not about me being on the mic calling games. It's about the athletes on the ice or on the field and about what they've overcome in their life to get to that point and about how sport has help them uh, get a new lease on life. It's, you know, that's what's really important. As Michael Ferrari sets the goal for Team Central. On a personal note, I want to thank Nico for everything he does. My friends and family have watched me play para ice hockey for Team Canada many times, all thanks to his service. It means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to other athletes as well. If you want to catch up on episodes of Level Playing Field, you can find them on the AMI-TV app, which you can download free in the App Store for iOS. I'm Greg Westlake. Thanks for joining us on Level Playing Field. Host Greg Westlake, producer Ted Cooper, segment producers Alex Smythe, Johanna Ryan, videographers Andrew Pickup, Matthew McGurk, Darcy Detoni, senior editor Matthew McGurk, editor Manuel Grados Andrade, Integrated Described Video Specialist, Simone Cupid. Audio Producer, Composer, and Engineer, Mike Monson. Graphics, Andrew Antonello, Mike Smith. Senior Producer, Michelle Dudas. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2020, Accessible Media Inc.